When I started learning linguistics, one of the things I was really interested in was the variation between all the languages. I wanted to learn about the languages that were most different from English, then that were really doing things in a very different way. So I could kind of imagine seeing the world from that perspective. I could expand my perspective beyond the language that I grew up with, English, and really imagine things from a different point of view. And so I was always looking for the most extreme variations in languages and the, the languages that were doing things differently somehow. But overall, I was surprised to learn that languages are more similar than I expected. Of course, there's obviously great differences between all the languages we can think of, but th it's always within certain boundaries. There's, there's certain, a certain range that human languages will tend to stay within. So there's, there's remarkable similarities between languages that we would see as completely different. Uh, it's sometimes described as just being a bunch of different switches. You have the same basic program, but you have these different switches that would say, okay, well, you know, here we'll put this word first, and that language says we'll put that word first, but overall within the same structure. Now, it's still highly debated uh, how much this is a universal structure, um, but it's clearly, there's clearly a pattern that all the languages follow. So th this concept is linguistic universals, and uh, one famous presentation of them uh, is uh, called Greenberg's Linguistic Universal. So it's a pretty simple thing he did, uh, but uh, it still stands uh, as a as something worth uh, worth thinking about for any linguist. It's uh, he just looked at thirty languages and he made note of everything they had in common. Very simple. Uh, I think there's room to really improve this and go for more languages, and there have been. Uh, attempts to do so. But this list gives some interesting ideas about what is universal in language. So it's 45 items and a lot of them uh, there is a sense of you know a lot, a lot of them are kind of have ifs like you know in this certain type of language uh, or like with overwhelmingly greater than chance frequency, things like, you know, almost always. Uh, you have these kinds of hedge words that suggest these things are not necessarily universal. And even the ones that Greenberg said are universal, uh, you know, there have been exceptions found for many of them. So these are not locked in as some kind of absolute universals but they are very strong tendencies and they reveal something about the the way that we approach language there there's something if there's i mean if we find something that is repeated in almost or every language in the world uh it's revealing something going on underneath so let's take a look at a couple of these just uh, just for fun uh a lot of them it is highly technical uh in the way they're described uh, it's really getting into the linguistics jargon. Um, and uh, but let, let's take a look at a few that are kind of interesting and, and maybe a bit simpler. So uh, here we have uh, the idea of, um, well, we look at basic word order. So here we have, you know, we have like English is subject, verb, object. So that's SVO. And that and SOV are the which is subject, object, verb, the verb at the end, like Japanese. These are the two by far most common word orders. And the third most common is VSO, having the verb first. And this is a big topic in syntax, trying to come up with some kind of a universal structure that applies to sentences in all languages. And so what is the basic order? Well, there's an interesting hint here that any language that has VSO as its order, its other option would be SVO. It's at least going to be an alternative or the only alternative. So it's just a little bit of hint that maybe there's something about SVO, possibly that is a bit more universal than SOV because 
there's always, even for any VSO language, it's going to have SVO there somehow. Uh, so just a little hint about that. Of course, word order, that's a whole other topic. There's lots to say about that. It's not usually completely fixed, there's a, and there's a lot of different variations, and the whole idea of what a basic order means is, uh, is somewhat debatable. But there, that gives like a little bit of a hint. Okay, here we have some... Uh, here's one that I find interesting uh, for yes-no questions. There's something universal about uh, yes-no questions. In any language in which yes-no questions are distinguished by intonation, as in the pitch of your voice, that intonation, that special question mark intonation, is always at the end. So you could say like a yes no question like, you know, is it is it raining? Is it raining? Then the, the my voice goes up at the end. That's the intonational pattern at the end of the question. It's not like is it raining? Like it's like some kind of intonation at the beginning. There's no language in the world in which you ask a yes no question by changing your pitch at the beginning of the sentence like is it raining? Or like, is it raining? Like, like there's, uh, there's no language that does that. It's always going to be at the end uh, in if the language does it. Not every language asks questions that way, but many do, and it'll always be at the end. Um, and here, well, let's go on to ah, another interesting thing about orders. We have a number 14. In conditional statements, the conditional clause precedes the conclusion normally in all languages. And that's the like in English the if clauses. We'd say if it is raining, I will carry an umbrella. Well, you that would be considered to be the basic normal order. You could also say I will carry an umbrella if it's raining. But that's not considered to be the basic or the most basic way is to say if this thing is true, then this thing and that applies to all languages. So that seems to show something about the way that we think, the way that we process this kind of conditional idea, this kind of imaginary possibility. We consider the possibility first and then the consequences of that possibility. I guess it makes sense logically if you think about it that way. First you imagine the possibility and then, well, what would result from that? If it is raining, I will carry an umbrella. Okay, so you set up the scenario first, if it's raining, and then the result of that. Um, then we look at, and there's a few that talk about the orders of nouns and adjectives, what's going on here. So it seems, I, I think it's pretty close to half and half. Um, the distribution, like many languages, uh, would have the adjective before the noun, like in English, we would say like a tall building. Uh, and French, they would, you know, do they would do like building tall, you know, like so they would they would have the adjective after, and this seems to be pretty much evenly distributed. It's like the opposite of a universal because it can kind of go either way, and languages can choose to put the adjective before the noun or after. Uh, but one thing that seems to be uh, almost universal, we have this overwhelmingly more than chance, this kind of hedge phrase, meaning usually, not always, but if you're going to put the adjective before the noun, also the demonstrative, like that, the numeral, like one, they would also go begin at the beginning. So you'd say the tall building, you'd say, you'd say you know, the, the that, that one tall building, those would all go at the beginning. I guess it seems to make sense that you'd put all those kinds of modifiers together. That, one, tall, they're all describing building. Makes sense to put them all before. Uh, but I guess it's not something that would be, be obvious. But then, well, we have a, we have a uh, possible insight about this whole adjective before or after thing. Now, it seems to be pretty much openly distributed that you can really go either way. Uh, with putting the adjective before or after the noun, but it seems like there is a bit of an asymmetry. When you put the adjective after the noun, there are there is there may be a minority 
of adjectives which usually precede. And you see that in French, like you have, you know, the adjective is typically after the noun in French, but you have a few adjectives that can uh, go before, like le grand, le grand edifice, the, the big building, you know, you the, the grand would come first. Uh, and a few of these adjectives, these uh, special set of smaller adjectives, they go before. Now, why is that? You never see that. You never see that after. Um, of course, you can, in, in English, you can have like these like special, you know, special cases like a, like a sergeant major and you have like, you know, where you have um, a knight errant, where you have like the adjective after, but that's like very, uh, very, uh, you know, just a few special words that have this as a special formation. But typically you can't ever normally put the adjective after the noun in English, you know, say like, this is uh, a dinner delicious. Uh, you just wouldn't say that normally. There's no exception. So this seems to suggest that there's maybe something that is more basic about putting the adjective first. Because even languages that they put the adjective after normally, they might have a few that they put the adjective first. But if you put the adjective first, you always put it first. Kind of suggests that maybe that's more basic. But, you know, like a lot of these, it simply gives a hint about what's going on uh, and doesn't say anything conclusive. Yeah, so, okay, let's go on to some patterns here. So here we talk about morphology, which is the structure of words and how they're, how they're arranged. So here we have, well, well, you know, what information do we put on the verb? Some languages just say like the verb and some languages have like a hundred different versions of each verb depending on all these different uh, situations. So this kind of gives the ranking of these, these details. Tense and mode categories, uh, as in the past and present or you know the real versus imaginary, uh, these kinds of distinctions, they come first. So of course, and that's something that we can imagine that, you know, typically, and we see that in English where we have a, the verb uh, can be present or past, and that's considered a very important distinction on the verb. You know, I have versus I had. And that, it, that comes first. But these other categories are considered less, person and number. Of course, we have that for a few irregular verbs like, you know, I am versus we are. Uh, he is and so on. So we have these, but only on a few verbs. So these are kind of more special. And of course, gender is some languages where the entire verb would be different depending on the gender of the subject. And so these are considered to be somehow of a more like, you could say a fussy level of detail, like a more, uh, they're, they're a higher level of detail. And any language that cares about these higher levels of details, they will certainly care about distinguishing tense first. And here we see here we see an asymmetry with gender and number. So verb agreement. There's many languages that have verb agreement in number, as in you have singular singular like we are, I am. And there's there's some languages that have this have a gender distinction uh, in their verbs. So the verb would be different depending on whether the subject or object is masculine or feminine. But number is considered to be more basic. There's no language that cares about gender, but not number. But there are languages that care about number and not gender. And that seems to match you know, the experience that you know, every language has number in some way. Like we can distinguish singular plural to some degree uh, but there are languages that seem to not care about gender at all uh, in terms of their their structure. They don't really, whereas other languages do have these very clear gender distinctions, but they also certainly care about number, singular and plural. And you can see that, you know, this, uh, yeah, here we see this kind of asymmetry between singular and plural. Uh, there's always, the, the, every language has some kind of singular and plural, and the plural is always the one that is marked, it always has some kind of, 
here they're calling a non-zero allomorph, as in it's somehow marked with like an extra little word, wordlet or a suffix or something. There's something to mark the plural, like we have like, you know, book and books. So we have that suffix to mark the plural in English. And there's no language that has, uh, there, uh, that has, you know, the basic form of the noun would be the plural. And then you have a special marking for singular. Again, that seems obvious. And we think about this idea of a book, you know, that's going to be a book. That's a singular. We think of the singular as being the more basic default thing when we're talking about a thing, book. Okay, if we want to talk about books, we want to talk about plural, then we add the extra marker to talk about plural. But the basic default thing is singular, and that seems to be universal. Now, what does that mean? I don't know, but it says something. It, it gives a little hint about the way that we interpret the world and we process things that we consider somehow the singular of a concept to be somehow more default and basic. And having multiple numbers of things is uh, considered to be like an extra piece of information, like, oh, it's more than one. Like that's something that you add on to the basic concept, which kind of seems obvious, makes sense, but I guess it's not something that would have to be automatic. Like you, it is possible to imagine a world in which we see plurals of things as being the basic thing. And then if you want to talk about there just being just one, well, you could highlight the just one. So we can imagine that, but no language actually does that. And you see further examples of that here, like, you know, like gender categories in non-singular, the, the singular, there's more concern with identifying the gender in a singular noun versus a plural. So there's many languages that would distinguish a singular male versus female, or masculine versus feminine in the singular, but then in the plural, it's just, just plural, and they don't have a distinction. So that's common. Um, and, but there's no language that cares about masculine versus feminine in the plural when there's many, but that doesn't care when there's one. So again, it seems to suggest the, the singular uh, being a more basic and default version of any concept. And here we see the minimum with, with pronouns. So uh, here we see pronouns standing for nouns. Uh, and there's, there's some languages that have so many different pronouns for every possible different variation of number and gender and person. And there's, there's and some languages only have a few. But every, every language has a minimum number of pronouns. There's not just like, it, they, can, they can't just use the word it or something to, or a word like that to refer to anything. There's always gonna be at least three persons. It can be like an I, a you, and a he or she. Every language has a different pronoun to refer to those things, which, which is interesting. I mean, we wouldn't consider that to be automatically obvious. I guess it is very convenient to be able to talk about I and you and he or she. So, uh, but I wouldn't assume that every language would automatically have that kind of distinction. And every language has a pronoun distinction between singular and plural. Uh, so there's no language that simply like has he, she, and they be entirely the same word. And like th there's always going to be some kind of a distinction like a he, she, it singular versus a they plural. So that's something that is shared by all languages. And here we see also, like, uh, 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 finally, we'll look at the asymmetry between the persons. So when we talk about gender distinction, the second and third person care more about a gender distinction. There's many, there's languages where, of course, we have this in English with our pronouns uh, that we have, like, he and she. He and she is in the third person. But the second person is just you, whether masculine or feminine, and the first person it's just I, whether masculine or feminine. But there are languages that actually you could say I, like the, even the word for I is different for masculine or feminine. Uh, and uh, certainly the, for many languages where it is, where the second person, the word for you is different, masculine and feminine. But in all those languages, they always distinguish gender in the third person at least. So the third person, I think really 
in, in many ways it seems to be like the most default person. I mean, I mean, you're literally talking about everything in the universe except me or you. Anything else is third person. Uh, so, uh, you know, that I, it seems to me reasonable that that is going to be the kind of the default uh, way that you're talking about most things. Uh, and that's where you apply most information, things like gender and number and so on. And then the first and second person are a special case. Yeah, and you see here again, yeah, gender in the plural. And it, there's always going to be gender distinction in the singular if you have gender distinction in the plural. So once again, suggest that the singular is really the most basic default thing. So taking a look at these different uh, universals, you can see that they don't say anything absolute uh, about uh, the way things are. They don't really give any automatic idea of exactly how we process these things and how we structure concepts and our vision of the world. But they do give some hints. So I find it interesting to just consider like there there's something about the way we process the world that tends to certain structures. And I think that's one of the most interesting things about linguistics. It's just that by studying the, I mean, so much about the way that we interpret the world is through the medium of language. And so by understanding the principles of language, we can really kind of see more clearly the way that we interpret the world. And so much that we take for granted about the way the world is, a lot of that may be closely connected to the way we interpret the world rather than being actually the way the world is just by itself. A lot of it is through our interpretation. So by really seeing this, and really bec and becoming aware of it, I think we can really get in sort of a higher level perspective on what's going on, how we process life, the universe, and everything, uh, simply by the way that we fit things in to our language. So that's why I really enjoy looking at linguistic universals.